Radio broadcasting, that is the transmitting of news, information and entertainment by radio and latterly by television, is just 100 years old in 2020. In this short presentation, we will see how the technology made it possible, how amateur enthusiasts kindled it, and how the authorities were initially against it. We will then look at one surviving piece of vital equipment used in an historic broadcast. Radio is very much taken for granted today and often overlooked in favour of other means of communication and entertainment. But a hundred years ago it had only just begun. For the first 20 years of the 20th century, technology had come along in leaps and bounds, but if you were clever enough to have built yourself a receiver or picked up a war surplus set, all you would have heard would have been the dots and dashes of Morse code. However, during the First World War, wireless sets had been designed to enable spotter plane pilots to communicate by voice to report enemy positions. After the conflict, these techniques were further developed by engineers at the Marconi factory in New Street, Chelmsford, Essex. And after lockdown closed the factory due to the Spanish flu pandemic in County Kerry, Ireland. Amateur radio enthusiasts were also experimenting with spoken word contacts between them. Originally, the Marconi test transmissions were half an hour a day to test the transmitters and enable listeners to calibrate their receivers. They consisted of readings from Bradshaw's railway timetables and then the daily newspaper. In the photo, we can just make out the two masts which supported the long wave aerial. Running alongside the building is a railway siding where finished equipment would be shipped out. Behind one of the two large loading doors is the workshop studio where the transmitter was located. As these transmissions seemed to prove popular with amateurs and listeners, the Marconi company then employed Winifred Sayer, a local singer, to add something a little more entertaining to the repertoire. However, they soon got more ambitious and with the help of the Daily Mail newspaper invited the famous Australian soprano Dame Nellie Melba to Chelmsford. She was apprehensive at first, but the offer of £1,000 soon persuaded her to set foot outside London. The prima donna even demanded a special train and a Rolls Royce to take her through the streets of, to the factory, cheered on by a prearranged crowd. She was also concerned about not having an audience to sing to, but when an engineer pointed up to the two 450 foot masts that supported the aerial and told her that from there she would be heard around the world, she is reputed to have replied, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are very much mistaken. Her recital took place on the evening of the 15th of June, 1920, and her voice was indeed heard throughout Europe the Middle East and probably further due to the 15 kilowatt long wave transmitter, making the transmission possibly the first pre-announced broadcast in the world. It was recently discovered that the broadcast may have been recorded in Paris, although it's not yet known if the recording has survived. Further concerts were given that summer, including recitals by Danish tenor Loritz Melcher and Dame Clara Butt. This is a picture of the 15 kilowatt transmitter used in those early broadcasts. It appears to have 14 valves and the engineer on the right is reading into the microphone from a newspaper. Despite the success of their broadcasting debut, the experiment was short lived. The then Postmaster General, the body responsible for wireless licensing, Frederick George Kellaway, revoked the station's license on the ground of interference to the new air traffic control system at Croydon Airport. Kellaway had always considered broadcasting trivial and that wireless should be reserved for purely official and military purposes. 
Croydon Airport was the first to have air traffic control radio and used a wavelength of 900 metres. Since the Marconi station was on 2700 metres, then interference was possible due to harmonic emission. The man with the pipe in the photograph is believed to be F.S. Mockford, a senior controller who would go on to invent the Mayday distress call. His wicker seat was a type made for fighter pilots during World War I. However, due to pressure from the public and the amateur radio community, the Marconi company was soon back on the air from London with the call sign 2LO as well as 2MT from Rittle near Chelmsford. In 1923 the London transmitter was taken over by the newly formed BBC. A most important component of the broadcast would have been the microphone, which is the Marconi type C100L, although it appears to be similar to British and American designs of the time. It also has a square wooden cone fabricated from a cigar box taped to the mouthpiece. The body of the instrument is nickel plated brass and the handle is made of ebonite. The microphone was supported by a hat stand and attached to it by a cord so the height could be adjusted to suit the singer. The sound quality would have been poor by today's standards as the microphone technology used was based on an electric current passing through carbon granules which vibrated in sympathy with the sounds it picked up. It was soon superseded by much more sensitive designs, however carbon microphones were still used in telephones up until the 1980s. We can hear a carbon microphone here. You're now listening to my voice via a carbon microphone of World War II vintage, although it uses exactly the same technology as Dame Nellie Melba's. The tiny microphone in your mobile phone or laptop is a direct descendant that has come a long way. Dame Nellie sang three songs, including Home Sweet Home, several encores, and finished with the national anthem. She seems to have been happy enough with her performance to have autographed the microphone for posterity. The instrument can now be seen in the basement gallery of the History of Science Museum, along with some other examples of Marconi's early apparatus. A century later, and a venture has been set up to record a modern soprano who has studied Melba's unique coloratura vocalization using an original microphone and transmitter and receiving the signal on an early crystal set. The sound can then be analyzed to determine what types of distortion have been introduced by the equipment. Digital processing techniques can then be used to restore the original voice quality. The restoration process can then be applied to the old recordings and then we can hopefully hear what Dame Nellie Melba really sounded like. You can find out more about this project, as well as articles on the beginning of broadcasting, details of the microphone, and even watch a play from these links. Finally, to give you some idea of what those radio enthusiasts, anxious pilots, and surprised seafarers heard that evening,